And it was at least twice the size of a 740, it's like two Boeing 747 airliners nose to tail. And it's between me and Indianapolis, so I rolled around and tried to get on its tail and or behind it, and it turned about 30 degree angles to the north and headed straight for Chicago, and then went over the horizon like, like that, and disappeared. There's no airplane can go that fast. And over the entrance to Hickam, uh, to uh, Pearl Harbor area, it's a, the entrance there was either nine, I said nine discs originally, so I'm going to keep it that way, with nine discs, white, perfectly white. And they were doing all kinds of different formations. A V, opposite L, reversed L, different types. We watched them for about 15 minutes. It's in a funny, pst, it's, they're off, it's gone. Uh, in 1952, orders were issued to military pilots in the United States. Shoot them down, flying saucers, if they don't land when instructed to do so. They have the newspaper articles proving that. Matter of fact, the head of the American Rocket Society wrote a letter to President Truman saying he didn't think that was a good idea. Not a good way to welcome anybody coming here. The American jet fighter pilot Milton Torres, stationed at the Manson RAF base in Britain, was on May 20th, 1957, ordered to go after and shoot down a large UFO, spotted on radar hovering over Ipswich. This enormous object, the size of an aircraft carrier, disappeared into the sky at the very instant he was to launch his rockets. I was thinking that if I fired this thing that uh, he may vaporize me. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was not of this earth. It was not a man-made object. This was something that was... <clears throat> they could stop. They could absolutely stand still, and they could go Mach 10 or more at any time. And a human being uh, would be splashed up against the sidewall from the forces of... of uh, just the momentum forces. Uh, that would de destroy you. So it was no, no, nothing that we humans know anything about. But many, many pilots in military planes who were ordered to go after and shoot down disks, they either disappeared or their planes crashed. This is another underbelly of this whole phenomenon. And before he died, Len Stringfield, who was the very first on the planet who had the courage to start publicly reporting that not only were there beautiful lights in the sky that moved in erratic patterns, but they were clearly involved with crash retrieval stories that were coming to him from military people who would not go on the record, that we were retrieving bodies, we were retrieving technology. And Len Stringfield said, Linda, I know firsthand that our government had a standing policy to take these disks down out of the sky until we had lost so many pilots that that order was rescinded around 1953 to 54. Books were now appearing on UFOs with pictures of saucers and cigar-shaped craft on close range, even with people claiming to have met the visitors in person. And soon the entertainment industry also joined the saucer wave. This somehow influenced on the image of the UFO issue, giving skeptics further reason for ridicule of the phenomenon. On July 1947, a major incident occurred near Roswell, New Mexico, the place where the US manufactured and stored its newly developed nuclear weapons. A flying saucer is reported to have crashed. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. The incident is revealed in the local newspaper, but withdrawn the day after. Weather balloons is the official explanation. Today, several military and civil eyewitness testimonials have surfaced concerning both the crash itself and the crash retrieval operations, indicating that it most probably was a vehicle of unknown origin.
Apollo astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon and also grew up as a Roswell resident, has recently gone public with his view on this controversial incident. I grew up in Roswell, New Mexico, which was the site of presumed alien crash in 1947, and which from what I call the testimony of the old timers who were there, and who had been hushed up by uh, government authority, military authority, on, almost on pain of death at the time, <clears throat> and who had harbored their, their knowledge quietly for years. And when I came back from the moon, and I was a local boy, they considered me uh, safe enough to tell their story to, uh, that they were a part of the recovery effort and the obser observer of the so-called Roswell crash, and that they they knew for sure that it was an alien craft. And subsequent uh, sightings, subsequent evidence has reaffirmed all of that, that we are being visited and have been visited by uh, uh, alien spacecraft and alien beings. And our governments around the world have covered it up. In response to this escalating UFO activity and public awareness, in September, two months after the Roswell crash, Project Grunge, later named Project Blue Book, was established by the U.S. Air Force as an official investigative body in UFO cases. The project collected civil and military reports and carried out an analysis of them. In 1969, after 22 years, the project was closed without reaching official conclusion. And that ended, to this day, the official comments from the US government on the UFO issue. But the UFO sightings didn't end. Going back to 1963, a command sergeant major in the US Army was assigned to the supreme headquarters of Allied powers in Europe, in Paris, France, and was given the highest top secret clearance. The story revealed to him there puts the phenomenon into a whole new perspective. And when I arrived in the summer of 1963, I was, my clearance was upgraded to cosmic top secret, which was then and still is today the, uh, the highest level of classification in NATO. And uh, when I arrived in the summer of 63, I learned of a study that was underway that had been initiated in 1961. <clears throat> Apparently, uh, an event had occurred on the morning of 2nd February 1961 that almost triggered World War III. A large number of circular metallic disks flying in formation flew out of the Soviet sector over the uh, Allied sector in a divided Germany flew off to the west. They turned north over the channel, over the English Channel, over the southern coast of England, and then they turned north and disappeared off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea, off the coast of Norway. Well, this incident almost triggered World War III because the Soviets, we found out, thought those objects belonged to us. And for a time, we thought they might belong to the Soviets. We were to find out that they didn't belong to either of us, the Soviets or us, that uh, it was a real story here. And they initiated a study in 61 to determine what in the world is happening here. They concluded after this three-year study that uh, the planet Earth and the human race apparently had been under some kind of survey or observation for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, by several extraterrestrial advanced intelligences. Now that literally, Terry, blew me out of the water. This document called an assessment, an evaluation of possible threat to Allied forces in Europe, was a secret NATO report on UFOs, distributed in 15 copies in the NATO system. Could that indicate that NATO at that time was fully aware of the UFO and ET presence? The U.S. military took UFOs very, very seriously during all through the Cold War and indeed beyond. Um, we have 
a fair amount of evidence, documentation, military documents, intelligence documents, that show very clearly that the U.S. military encountered objects that did not seem normal, did not look normal, and had an extraordinary behavior, violating sensitive airspace uh, again and again and again. So the question is not, do UFOs exist? The question is, who do they belong to? And indeed, guess what? This was exactly the question I discovered that U.S. military analysts asked. They were no dummies. So they knew there's only a couple of possibilities here. Question number one back in the 40s and 50s was, uh, are these Soviet devices? In the context of the Cold War, that's important. You need to find out. Did the Soviets come up with a revolutionary uh, type of propulsion and so forth? Well, they looked into it and, and the answer did not seemed to be yes. It looked like it was a no. And indeed, that seems to be the answer today. So then question number two is, is this a secret project that we're doing somewhere in the bowels of the American military complex? That's a fair question. It's entirely possible. But again, it's also possible that that isn't the answer. And indeed, a lot of the evidence doesn't seem to point that way. Uh, the fact, for example, that our jet fighters were chasing these objects again and again is one thing that points to that. If it was a secret American project, why continually, year after year, scramble your own military to chase them down? So then there's a third option, and in the context of the late 1940s, it was, are they interplanetary spaceships? That was really the only other option people could think of at the time. And guess what? There were many analysts from the 1940s and all throughout the period that we can get any information on this. But yes, there are many people who argued that this was the case. Incredible stories continue to happen. Um, the most interesting of those cases occurred in November of 1965. Uh, there were UFO reports in New York State, all over New England, of objects being sighted above power lines, uh, it, over power plants, over power relay stations. Um, I forget the gentleman's name, but one of the FAA regional directors was flying in a private plane near Syracuse, New York and they saw a large fiery ball pass over power lines at a place called the Clay Power Substation. And as soon as the object was directly over the lines, from horizon to horizon, all the lights went out as far as this man could see. And initially he thought that he had gone blind temporarily, you know, something had happened, and then he realized that <laughs> there was no power. And it, it became what is known as the Great Northeast Blackout. Uh, it's an incredible instance in, on 17 November 1986 of a Japan Airlines plane that was flying from uh, Tokyo, I'm sorry, Tokyo to Paris to, to, uh, through Alaska, encountered three large shelled walnut type objects. The largest was described intermittently in different reports as either the size of one or two U U.S. aircraft carriers. They were pacing the plane, they were making aerodynamic movements which were scaring the pilots. Uh, it's an amazing incident in that possible five different agencies were all tracking these objects at the same time, namely the FAA, the CIA, NASA, the U.S. Air Force, and I presume Japan Airlines when the calls came in. It's one of the most heavily documented cases ever. There's transcripts that come out of the black box that, that were frightening. Uh, it turned out that the Reagan administration was excited about all this because they had never gotten so much documented information on a UFO incident ever in history. So they convened a scientific advisory board that in January was going to study all the information. As far as that scientific advisory committee, John Callahan, who was a senior FAA official, was on top of all this. He was excited too. He had looked all of the data. He said they never had anything this good. 